Maggie and Dichnikaz, Nogigan Do Dem, Curve Lake, and Dunjaba. Hi, my name is Maggie. I'm a linguistics major and a First Nation and Indigenous Studies minor. I speak English, Danish, and I'm currently learning German. And I am Ojibwe, specifically from the Curve Lake First Nation. A lot of people don't think I'm native when they look at me first. They kind of go, what? But when I have my hair braided and my feather earrings in, they're kind of like, yeah, you look native today. I'm like, don't I look native every day? I'm a little offended. But anyways, if you're unfamiliar with North American geography, we are definitely not in Ojibwe territory right now, or at least I'm not. My Algonquian language is spoken in Eastern Canada and is a relative of Cree not in the Coast Salish language family. So the, the dynamic here is different. One language family back home will encompass a huge part of the map, whereas here, one language family will take up a little part and then other language families will surround it. Both Ojibwe and Cree, its relative, have a healthier status in Canada compared to other indigenous languages. And for my community, that's promising. So I grew up in a little town called Buckhorn in Ontario, but I went to a high school in the city called Peterborough at an arts-based high school. I focused on drama. When I was younger, I went to school on the reserve until grade one, and I learned Ojibwe there. I definitely knew more when I was younger, but now not so much. My granny and my kobada, which means great grandma, speak the language fluently. My mom has a pretty good grasp on it, and my brother has been learning the past couple of years and can speak much better than me. My cousin uh, is also learning the language, and I would say he's fluent, but if you ask him, he might not say that. Either way, he's a really good resource if I ever have any questions about the language. So Ojibwe is broken down into morphemes, and morphemes, for those of you who don't know the term, is the smallest composition of meaningful sound. So Ojibwe uses these morphemes and builds words and sentences. For some, this is an abstract concept, but a lot of languages, a lot of languages function this way. Now I'll tell you a couple cool things about Anishinaabemowin, the Ojibwe language. In the Ojibwe language, there are more verbs than nouns. When you add a suffix on some of these verbs, it makes them into nouns. Nouns can be put into two categories, inanimate versus animate. Inanimate beings are those that are either a living thing, something that can move on its own, or has a heartbeat. So, so some examples of this would be weather words, things in the environment like trees or rivers, and some things that you wouldn't think to be animate, like your nail. Inanimate objects or beings are the opposite of animate. They're considered non-living beings. So an example of this would be like a log. Another cool thing about the language is that there's no distinction between he and she. The word ween is used for both situations. The suffix gun is a nominalizer that changes a verb into a noun. So if you have a verb like nabu, which means to sleep, the noun, a bed, which is a sleeping thing, would be nabu gun. Another nominalizer that makes a verb into a noun is win. This is usually added on abstract ideas or concepts. So the word nagowin, no. So the word nagamawin means song. Okay, and another example of this suffix is in Anishinaabemowin, the word for Ojibwe language. The suffix bisa is used to refer to uh, the manner, the mode, or characteristic of rain or wet precipitation. So to say, it's starting to rain, or it starts raining, would be majibisa. If you hear the prefix mano, that, that refers to a positive quality like good, pretty, or nice. So if you want to say something like, it's a beautiful day, or it's a nice day, you would say minigishgud. Which, minigishgud is actually the name of my niece in Anishinaabemowin. Cool fact. So it's a little hard for me to connect to Ojibwe here, but uh, I did take a Hunkaminam course at Musqueam, and I really enjoyed being on the reserve and learning from Elder Larry Grant. He was very uh, enchanting and very kind, um, but I didn't realize how different linguistically and culturally it was in comparison to Ojibwe. 
Um, for example, here, when you walk in ceremony, you go counterclockwise, whereas back home, we go clockwise. And to some, um, some people don't pick up on these customs and ways, and they might just think that it's walking, but it has a lot more significance and meaning than that. Um, so another thing that I've taken from the Hunkaminam course and from being on this, this side of the coast uh, is raising your hands for gratitude and appreciation. I do that back home and no one knows what I'm doing. They kind of look at me like, why are you showing me your hands? And I'm just like, it's a way to say thank you. So thank you. <laughs> like, I really like that way. So with my degree, I'm not really sure what I want to do yet. Um, be a teacher, I don't think I'd really be good at it because I find it difficult to explain things. So I don't think I would be very helpful to the students. Um, and research, not really into it either. But maybe I'll do something with creating programs for language revitalization or something along those lines. Uh, my aforementioned brother Nathaniel and my cousin DJ are really close and they learn the language together. They've even made a couple podcasts to help. So language revitalization within my community is something that's getting more talked about. We even have uh, weekly language classes. So if you can't come, you're able to sign in online and still be a part of the course. So that's pretty cool. Since I'm here for most of the year, during the summer I try to go home and bask in the Ojibwe and in my community. But unfortunately this year I won't be going home for the full four months and I'm a little bit bummed about it because usually I will work in the community with one of the programs that they have set up for students to work with older members. Um, I, I thought about going into speech science. No, no, I have not. <laughs> speech science is not me at all, okay. With linguistics, I know I don't want to go into speech sciences. I don't have anything against the field. I'm just not really into it. Uh, same goes for research, not that into it. I like um, interacting with younger people and with kids. So I want something that is interactive. I wouldn't want a 9 to 5 office job, I think I would probably go crazy. Um, and I would want to do something that utilizes my background in drama and creativity. So I'm, I'm not sure, in the summer working with uh, the Curve Lake First Nation day camp, I met a man who uh, does film and video production and he said if I ever wanted to do some sort of collaboration with film and language revitalization that he would be up for that. So maybe that's something, an avenue that I can go down. Um, just because something's clear, not clear right now, doesn't mean it's non-existent. I think UBC does try with uh, Indigenous languages and curriculum, but I think that they still have a far way to go. I find UBC addresses uh, some Indigenous topics better than other schools back home, or at least from what I've read, it seems that way. Especially in linguistics, a lot of the professors work in communities and on uh, local indigenous languages and so they'll bring their data into the classroom and we'll work on it so that's really cool. On this topic I try to be positive uh, with the steps that they're making and see these as, as good things. Um, some people might be a little dismissive but I think every good action should be acknowledged and celebrated. Um, I've heard that some schools are starting to make it mandated that you have to take a First Nations course and I think that is awesome, fantastic, that's how it should be at all schools and I think especially UBC. Um, UBC is such an international school so a lot of the students don't know the histories of the people here or of the First Nations people in Canada so I think it's really important that we acknowledge and share this, this information and address the issues. Having Ojibwe here would be great, but what's more important is how they're taught. Um, you can't just have a teacher up there speaking. It's very colonial, very Western schooling. So if you had it in an Indigenous setting and with Indigenous dynamics, the structure would be better and it would be more appropriate. Um, I read a book by Helen Roy, an Anishinaabekwa, who advocates for this um, indigenizing the language learning. And ever since my mom brought home this book and I've read it, she's changed the perception I have on how languages should be taught. Uh, I learned French and it was a lot of just memorizing words and conjugations and phrases and it wasn't very beneficial. 
Whereas with indigenous languages, the teacher would be undoubtedly sharing knowledge about the culture as well as the language because they go hand in hand. But revitalization doesn't just end in the classroom, it needs to go beyond that. It needs to go into the families and the communities. One thing that my elders have taught me is that language comes to us in many forms through songs, through dance, through ceremony, through dreams. So even if the language isn't being spoken right now, it might still come back to us. Miigwech.